you've been through a lot. It's a strange feeling when somebody finally acknowledges with words the entire experience of your life. It wasn't until I was 35 years old that somebody said that to me. And it made me realize for the first time that I have been through a lot and that it's the things that we go through that shape the person that we become and how we handle the difficult things that might yet come our way. Growing up, it felt like I had a normal childhood. I had a family full of people. I had a mum, I had a dad. I had an older sister and a younger brother. On the outside looking in, I was happy-go-lucky. My mum said that I had a smile that could light up a room. But the truth was that I often felt disconnected from the people around me. Like I wasn't really a part of my own family. Like I was on the outside, trying my best to get a look in. Now I can look back at those times and see the moments that were the first stages of my low self-esteem. But I wasn't aware of what was happening inside of me, let alone around me at the time. Times when I was on the outside, times when I was on my own, disconnected. The problems in my parents' marriage, the reality that the dad I'd grown up adoring wasn't my real father, all of the little things that later add up. I met my husband in 2013 playing an online video game. We lived on opposite sides of the country and started to talk every day about our lives and things we had in common and our mental health. Like me, he'd struggled with anxiety and depression for many years. Like me, he'd experienced trauma. And like me, he'd built up many walls and hadn't had any lasting relationships, friendship or otherwise. For six months, we got to know each other. We went back and forth, visiting for weekends and special occasions. He met my family and I met his. They accepted me for exactly who I was and I grew to love them in return. We got married in 2017 and it was a beautiful day. My new father-in-law made a speech and it made my new mother-in-law cry. Mum made a speech and it made me cry. There'd been a lot of loss in my life up to that point and though there were people who were no longer with us that I would have loved to have had there, it was about as perfect a start to a whole new life that I could imagine. My husband and I had been together for several years when he said to me that he didn't understand how I functioned on a daily basis. My depression was very bad. I would go to the dark place often and I would stay there. I would drown myself in the fun things that I liked to do that would occupy my brain and keep me entertained and I would just keep going I would just keep walking through the darkness until one day I found myself back out of it again there was no direction there was no active trying 
to deal with the depression, trying to find the causes of it, trying to understand, trying to fix it, trying to help myself feel better. I would just keep going until I found my way out of it somehow. I thought that that's what resilience meant. Keep going, even when things are tough. Keep going through the dark patches, the dark periods of my life, and come out the other side of it. But that wasn't true. I wasn't becoming more resilient. I was just becoming more used to being depressed. It became my natural default state. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. The Manchester University NHS Foundation defines adverse childhood experiences as highly stressful and potentially traumatic events or situations that occur during childhood and or adolescence. It can be a single event or prolonged threats to and breaches of a young person's safety, security, trust or bodily integrity. These can range from emotional, physical and sexual abuse, to being exposed to a caregiver with trauma or mental illness, and losing a parent to death, divorce or abandonment. The first person who acknowledged what I had been through was a family support worker. I had reached out hoping to get something in place for when my family were about to go through a bereavement. I didn't realise at the time that by reaching out, I would become the focus of the support that was offered. It made sense. The idea was that in order to support my husband and my son, I would need somebody to support me. On this day, after going through a detailed history of my life, recalling the things that I'd been through, the support worker paused. She looked at me. You've been through a lot, she said, and it didn't feel like a pleasantry, because she followed it up with a plan, and for the first time in my life I felt like it would be a good thing to take the offer of support, not just for the potential impact that it might have on the other people of my life, me getting help, but for myself. <laughs> So, Emma. Hi. Hi, wonderful Emma. We met two years ago now. Is it actually two years? Yeah. Oh my God. Two years ago this summer um, on the ACES recovery course mm -hmm. through creating communities. So I was told it was a group thing, but I didn't know how big the group was and I yeah. I remember I was a little bit late, I think, and what did it like when everyone sort of just sort of stood sitting down and was like, oh God, this is quite scary. Yeah. And I've obviously, and as you're aware from our classes, I do have trauma from my, my teenage years where, um, like, my dad did assault us and it's carried with me a long time and there was other things going on in the background that probably to some people weren't as damaging, but for me they were. And I think the when they said about what the course was about, where it's like you don't pass the trauma on to your child, I realised like I probably would end up doing that obviously at the time so if it was two years ago Leah was five maybe four mm. and um, I just I felt like I'd done already done damage like not physical or anything like that nothing but from seeing me in so much pain and not understanding how, why I felt so low disregarded and I didn't want to I didn't want to pass any of that on and it was nice like to be honest when I got told sort of a little bit about sort of we'll call it the curriculum the kind of plan that they had for us where it was like you work through your past traumas you work through your trauma now and you're distinguished what is yours and what isn't I it really appealed because it turns out I'm carrying a lot of her inherited trauma as well from both sides of parenting not intentionally especially by my mum you know like she never intentionally do but she obviously has her her like issues with her mum's death and stuff like that and I, I think it broke her heart completely and it still does to this day. Yeah. So you carry that pain 
especially with my own personal actions of self-harming and stuff like that when I was younger and it's another thing rip, like almost getting ripped away from her that she loves and I never understood it until I yeah. became a mum and grew up basically. It is, it, it changes you completely when you become a mum, when you become a parent. Yeah. Um, for me, like, I had years and years of depression and anxiety and to be honest, like, I didn't really care. I didn't care about the effect that it had on myself, the effect that it had on people around me. Like, it took me a long, long time to, for, for the first two years of his life, um, he's, he's on the autistic spectrum. For the first two years of his life, he was non-verbal. And to be honest, he didn't need to be because it was just me and him. So I would know what he wanted and I'd give him what he wanted. And I lived like for him. Like that was everything. I lived for him. Um, but I was kind of like, am I, am I doing this to him? Am I holding off a part of myself? And like, as well as like, keeping him from other people because of the way that I am, am I isolating him? And is that having an effect? This was one thing as well that came up during the ACES course. And it was, I think it was quite later on. Um, there was somebody was talking, I think it was Michaela, um, was talking about um, being disciplined mm -hmm. um, as a child. And I just went, I, this cold feeling came over me. And I sat back in the class and I was just like, and I remembered, like, in the mo we weren't allowed to be noisy in the morning. We weren't allowed to make any noise. If we made any noise at all, we would get beaten. And I mean, like, beaten. Um, and I just, I just went cold. Like, I'd completely forgotten about it. I'd, I'd obviously buried it. And I was just like, I hadn't even thought about that. I hadn't considered that at all. Like... That was abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, I, I buried it. And it made me think like, with my own son, how can you, you can't expect young kids to, to not make noise, to, to be quiet. The impacts of that are, are long lasting. And that's mm -hmm. something that I didn't want to, to put on my son. But it's understanding, some things are out of your control. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like you said yourself, like with, with your parents, um, your mum feeling guilt over the physical abuse. Yeah. That wasn't her fault and it was something that was beyond her control. No, I Things completely happen. agree. I think as well with that one, so I don't think we've said it, like during this interview, we were saying it before, the guilt she feels for not being able to protect us from what happened, like she would have died. Yeah and she almost did trying to protect us and I'm actually quite grateful that me and my sister protected her with every part of us hmm. because it just showed how much we loved each other and in a weird way we share a pain and a trauma we all process it differently hmm. but it's something that is weirdly like binding because like as bad as things can get when you have like a sisterly squabble or like a tantrum at your mum. For, for me, it's remembering how much they loved me to throw themselves in front of me and the fact that I did it without hesitation for them too. Yeah. And that's like, I don't know, it's kind of nice that I come, like with the, with the pain came so much love and care as well. And that's something that I want to instill in Leo. And I think the ACEs course helped with that a lot in the sense of sort of knowing what's yours, knowing what someone else is, and looking at the positive side of such a negative experience and yeah. the resilience you have in yourself. There was so much self-appreciation and I love the fact that it was encouraged to pass it on to your kids and stuff like that and to really ground yourself. Like you're saying about looking at that list, I'm looking at that list and thinking, oh my God, maybe Leo's got some of these. Yeah. However, he is so surrounded by love. Yeah and care and not just from me from the people I bring into my life as well yeah. and that's the most important thing and I think that's something that also Ace has helped with maybe indirectly but it's created such a strong sense of community of people who like you say there were only eight of us left out of 20 who really cared about one another when one of us was upset when one of us was yeah. in pain we came together and we felt it together yeah. and 
there was something so beautiful about it and I remember coming in one time and I think I was a bit broken that day yeah. and the love that surrounded me the care the post-it notes we used to leave each other which was so fun and we were so dramatic when we'd give each other them to make a point that freaking read it and I yeah. love that it was so powerful Meeting Emma and the group of women who supported us through the ACES recovery program was just a single step on my journey to recovering from the complex trauma that I'd gathered during my life. But it was an important one. Through having support that was reciprocal and non-judgmental, I was able to start focusing upon the one thing I had always been terrible at, being kind to myself. Self-care became a necessity that I had up until then been unaware that I'd been desperately missing. Learning to be at peace with myself is a lifelong process, one that I'm not yet proficient at, but it's enabled me to able to put myself first and go after things that I've always regretted not doing. And it helped me get through one of the most difficult things that my family has ever had to enjoy. In January 2022, my father-in-law, Derek, passed away. It was lymphoma. And by the time that he was diagnosed with it, the cancer had spread beyond what treatment was able to manage. We spent what would be his last Christmas with him. But by the time that the new year arrived, the cancer had spread into his brain and he had seizures that he never recovered from. For eight days we sat by his hospital bed in the lounge at home and we were with him when he died. Leaving a tremendous loss in not only our lives but the many lives that he touched. Everybody responds differently to grief. And though I'd put support in place for myself and my family, the sense of loss was immense. Over the next two years, we went through so much as a family and I'm not sure we would have gotten through any of it without me developing the ability to process trauma in a healthy way. I'd been recommended a new therapist by the same family support worker that had gotten me onto the ACES course and had been undertaking a form of therapy called EMDR, which is designed to alleviate the distress associated with traumatic memories. I had been through counselling several times before, but it had never really taken. This time was different. It went deeper than anything I'd done before, allowing me to reprocess trauma that I'd carried with me my whole life and understand things that had happened to me in a whole new way. Part of the EMDR process involved a flow back exercise where you connect the memory surrounding the trauma with the time in the past that you felt the same way. I remembered the night that my stepfather left the family home. My siblings and I were stood at our bedroom window as he took his bicycle and went out of the back gate. And we watched as he rode it down the street behind our house and disappeared when he turned a corner. We later learned that he'd rode all the way to his mother's house, which was about eight miles away, on his own, in the dark. I remember being heartbroken when he left, wishing that he could stay it felt so unfair. But I also remembered that since that night I'd had a recurring dream in which I was traveling down the long main road by our house over and over. Through EMDR I was able to connect the two things 
and I realised that for most of my life, whenever I felt particularly vulnerable, I'd been following him. I had been chasing after my dad, the man that would go on to abandon both me and my little brother when his relationship with my mother broke down. The man that broke our hearts all over again. When Derek died, it brought that trauma back. When I broke down and cried in the arms of my husband like I was never going to be able to stop. I was also crying for that little girl who had watched her daddy leave. And tried to follow him, even when it had long become clear that he wasn't worthy of being chased. The past four years have been very difficult. My family has been through a lot, and at times that really took its toll. But with the hard times has come a lot of self-care and deep reflection. It's no longer enough to keep pushing through the times that were challenging, believing that in order to be resilient, I had to lose myself in the dark times and see what was left of me when I came out the other side. But it's okay to not be okay, but it's not healthy to linger there for too long. And that self-care is not selfish, it's essential. I've surrounded myself with positivity, learned how to set boundaries, learned how to put myself first for once. I'm still a work in progress. The next chapter of my book is yet to be written. But for now, I'm beginning to think that's enough.